everyone, I'm Rebecca and welcome back to my channel. I don't know if you can tell, but I'm kind of into Victorian era fashions. <laughs> in fact, last month over on Instagram, where I'm also at Lady Rebecca Fashions, I hosted hashtag Victorian March, an Instagram challenge with a different theme every day, all centered on the Victorian era. And if you participated, thank you so much for joining me in that challenge. But I realized that while there were a couple of costumes that I did share more than once during the month, there were also some costumes that I didn't share at all. In other words, I have more than 31 Victorian era costumes. So with this video, I A, wanted to give all of those costumes a little bit more love, and B, I feel like the Victorian era, or specifically the Bustle era, which is my favorite, has been getting a lot more attention and interest lately due to the popularity of the Gilded Age on HBO. And of course, in my sewing vlogs lately, I have been doing a lot of Victorian era sewing as well. So I figured it might be fun if we took a chronological look at all of my different Victorian era outfits, starting with the beginning of the Victorian era and going all the way through until we reach the Edwardian era. Now, of course, the Victorian era spans a rather long time because Queen Victoria reigned from 1837 to 1901. So within these 64 years, we see a whole lot of different styles. And it's also really interesting to see these styles evolve as well. In fact, I have already done a couple of videos on the evolution of historical styles, not just in the Victorian era, but including a couple of decades on either side as well, both of which I will link below in the description. One of these videos covered just undergarments and the other covered the outer garments as well, but I only shared one outfit per style change. And I have a whole lot more than just that in my costume wardrobe when it comes to most of the Victorian era. So let's start with the late 1830s and look at all of my historical costumes, as in not cosplays, from then through 1901. Last year, I made a plaid late 1830s dress, which was based on a couple of fashion plates from 1837, just like what Queen Victoria would have been wearing in the first year of her reign. I'll link the playlist for this project down below in the description, but this was made of plaid silk taffeta with the skirt flat lined with stiff cotton organdy to help give it even more body. The sleeves of the late 1830s were still highly decorative, but the volume of the poof had decreased compared with earlier in the decade, and the waist of the bodice was starting to go down to quite a natural waistline. Dresses in this era were worn over corded petticoats, usually with multiple petticoats on top, and the hemlines of dresses had started to go back down, so that ankles no longer showed like earlier in the decade. Arm size were also starting to dip off the edge of the shoulders. With arm size waistlines and hemlines dropping, it's a very natural and easy transition into the 1840s. This blue textured silk dress is my only 1840s dress. I made this in 2019 using McCall's 7988 as my base, and if you want to learn more about how I made it, I actually just released a video all about this project last week, which I'll link down below. Although this dress was not a super common style in the 40s, it does have several very popular 1840s elements, such as the shirred front in the bodice and the pointed front at the bottom of the bodice, the arms eye starting quite far off the shoulder, although as I mentioned in the How I Made video for this dress, I didn't take it nearly far enough off the shoulder, and the full cartridge pleated skirt. Like the 1830s, the silk skirt is flat lined with cotton organdy, and this is also worn over a corded petticoat and starch ruffled petticoat, though the corset shape has now changed to one that provides a more nipped in waist and more curves altogether. My main 1850s dress is one of the first historical costumes I ever made, way back in 2010, and yet I still use this costume a ton. This consists of a cartridge pleated, very full skirt, a pagoda sleeved bodice, and an ivory full sleeved fitted blouse with Peter Pan collar. I used Simplicity 3727 to make this outfit. The pagoda sleeve where it bells open at the bottom revealing either a full blouse sleeve or a tied in partial sleeve underneath was extremely popular from the very early 1850s through about 1862. And by 1864, they were completely out of style. Because this costume fits the popular fashion for such a span of time, I've worn it both with and without hoops. Hoops, or really 
cage crinolines became popular in the middle of the 1850s with the first patent granted for one in 1856. So sometimes, particularly when I wear this costume on stage, I will wear it with the same corded petticoat and starch ruffle petticoat combo that I did for earlier in the Victorian era, and sometimes I'll wear it with a smaller hoop skirt. In 2012, I also made a ball gown bodice and overskirt combo to go with the same cartridge pleated underskirt. Last fall, I rigged this bodice with a separating zipper so that I could quick change into it as Joe and Little Women, but I did originally make it to lace up the back. It has a very wide open neckline that was so popular in the mid-Victorian era, and again, this bodice style stayed popular for over a decade, which is one of the reasons that I've worn both the day and evening versions of this ensemble so many times. My other 1850s dress is a slightly less practical sheer dress, and I used Simplicity 4551 as the base pattern for the dress. Sheer dresses were very popular for summer and were made out of fine sheer fabrics, which for day wear I believe were usually cottons. Mine though is actually made out of poly window sheer fabric, but because it's rather open weave and sheer, it's still quite comfortable to wear even in summer. The bodice has a built-in partial lining which leaves the lower part of the sleeve and the neck area sheer, but acts as a fitted lining through the bodice and short sleeve area. The sheer layer of the bodice has a gathered front, and because of the lightweight nature of the fabric, the skirt is also gathered as opposed to cartridge pleating. This again can be worn with or without hoops underneath, though it was hemmed to go over hoops. Moving into the mid-1860s, we come to one of my plainer costumes. This cotton calico dress, or actually bodice and skirt combo, though historically speaking it almost certainly would have been a dress, which I made last fall to wear as Meg and Little Women. I have a video all about how I made this dress, which I'll link down below, but this was made incredibly quickly, and in fact, I was attempting to make it as a one-day project, though it wound up taking more like two and a half. It's made of cotton quilting fabric from Joann's and trimmed with a little bit of velvet ribbon, and although this has a completely different look from the sheer dress, I actually also started with Simplicity 4551 for this dress as well. This dress is not made to go over hoops, despite being from the 1860s, because it was designed to be worn by a poorer person, so this is worn over the corded and ruffled petticoats. My next 1860s dress is rather specific, and because of that, it has unfortunately only been worn once for Costume College 2016, despite being one of the most time-consuming projects I have ever made, and that is my Victorian child dress. It's a copy of an extant dress in the Boston MFA, though I added short sleeves to mine, and it probably would have been worn by a preteen girl. It was such a time-consuming project for multiple reasons. I dyed my own salmon-colored silk, I made a shortened hoop skirt and ruffled petticoat to support the skirt, I made a teddy bear purse and painted fugui boots to match, but mostly, what took absolutely forever was that all of the zigzag trim had to be hand sewn down on both sides of the trim. I basically forced myself to do at least a little bit of it each day, even while I was working on other projects. So now I just need to find another excuse to wear it! My other fancy 1860s project is also a specific recreation, but at least in this case I've actually gotten to wear it three times. I recreated this giant turquoise ball gown, as I call it, from the painting of Infanta Isabel de Bourbon y Bourbon, which was painted by Vincente Palmaroli in 1866. I wore this dress in an unfinished, unembellished state to the Victorian Festival in 2017, then with its grand train and all of the trimming to Costume College that year, and again to the Victorian Festival in 2018, but without the court train. It's made of tissue silk taffeta that a friend got for me in Thailand, and is trimmed with silk organza dyed to match the turquoise silk taffeta, along with I don't even know how many yards of embroidered mesh lace trim. I literally bought out all that they had from three or four Joann's in the area, plus ruched mesh, ruched satin ribbon, pleated satin ribbon, and satin ribbon bows. The first time that I put it on with all the train and everything, I was giddy because I had never felt so beautiful in anything before. I also made the orders, sash, earrings, and lacy headpiece to match the ones that Isabel wears in her portrait. My last 1860s ensemble is one of my earlier historical costuming projects, which is this one that I made in 2012. This outfit dates to the late 1860s, and I call it my pink candy stripe early bustle gown. 
In the very late 1860s, we start to see that evolution from the crinoline era to the bustle era. And there are a few ways that we see this evolve. First, the round hoop skirt from earlier in the 60s evolves into an elliptical shape, smaller around in front and then very large and sweeping in the back. Arm size also start to move up the shoulder from their dropped shoulder state of earlier in the 60s to a much more natural placement by about 1870. And we also see multiple layers of skirts for daytime, with the upper layers looped or bustled up in various ways. So this candy bustle dress follows all of those trends. It's actually made of multiple pieces, an underskirt, overskirt, underbodice, and overbodice, plus a sash. Though I think it's more likely that the overbodice and overskirt would have been connected at the waist, kind of like a jumper or pinafore. Having that overbodice look was very popular in the late 1860s, and even into the early 1870s, and you often see fashion plates with that low square neckline of the overbodice. My underskirt and bodice are made of a very annoying herringbone linen, while the outer layers are cotton quilting fabric, and I believe this was a self-drafted pattern. I also made a matching pink and white elliptical cage crinoline to go with it. That brings us into the 1870s and the bustle era. The early 1870s is one of my favorite eras. The elliptical cage crinoline has condensed some and has evolved into what is called a crinolette. I still need to make an actual crinolette, but I have been making do for a few years now with my Franken crinolette, which is literally my super old small store-bought hoop skirt, which has been pinned underneath my hugely wide but very short lobster tail bustle that I made for my Jane from Tarzan cosplay. The bustle helps to swing the hoops backward to create the right shape, but I really do need to make an actual crinolette. Anyway, my earliest dress of this era is the blue Tissot-inspired bustle that I made just as the world was shutting down in February and March of 2020, and which I actually hope to wear out of my neighborhood for the first time in a couple of weeks to the Port Townsend Victorian Festival. I do have a video on how I made this dress, so I'll link that down below, but it's made out of, I think, something like 14 yards of Supima cotton, because anything with that many pleats just eats fabric like nobody's business. It consists of an underskirt, overskirt, and bodice, and a matching hat, of course. I have a whole lot of early 1870s fashions, since I love it so much, but I think that chronologically, the next one up would be my fairy godmother bustle, which is a copy of an ensemble which, at least as of a few years ago, was at the Manchester Gallery, though I can no longer find it on their website. Theirs consisted of the skirt with attached overskirt drapes, day bodice, sash, and evening bodice, so I decided to make all of those pieces too. Mine is made of periwinkle silk taffeta from the LA Fabric District, which is the same fabric that I'm currently using to make my natural form gown, as well as a pink taffeta that is either just poly or possibly is a poly silk blend, which is from the New York City Fabric District and was nearly the same price as the real silk from LA, I might add. The skirt is lined with the pink taffeta, as are all of the pleats and the overskirt drapes, and even some of the bows are made with both fabrics, as all of this was visible from the museum's photos. The pleats on the front of the skirt and around the neckline and sleeves all have little half bows hand sewn into the folds. The evening bodice is made of the same fabric, though this one is trimmed with very sheer ruched netting around the bodice and over the sleeves, which is a very sweet touch. Like the Tissot-inspired dress, I wear this over my Franken crinolette. This is one of my favorite costumes that I've made because the colors and bows just make it all look so cheerful, and also because I really think I nailed the recreation. Moving a tiny bit later in the 1870s, we're coming to my burgundy velvet ribbon gown, which is based on a fashion plate from 1874, which hangs in my bedroom. This was the costume I was making when I first started my YouTube channel in January 2020, so I do have a video on the making of this gown, which I'll link in the description. It's made of burgundy micro velvet with an underskirt that's white poly taffeta, with ivory silk taffeta mounted on the bottom where it shows. Everywhere that is ivory silk has been crisscrossed all over with yards upon yards of velvet ribbon. Although this plate dates to 1874, I feel like the dress has an earlier look to it. It may just be the way that she's sitting, but it seems more like something from like 1872 or earlier, which would have still been worn over the crinolette, so that's how I wear mine as well. I'm also looking forward to wearing this one for the first time for the fashion show at the Victorian Festival. 
Really though, by 1874, the bustle would have morphed into something a little smaller and less round. In other words, the crinolette was no longer needed at this point. So for this next ensemble, which is a black silk ball gown based on this mid-1870s fashion plate, whose exact year I can't find, I wear just a lobster tail bustle with ruffled petticoat over it. This is a very different style of ruffled petticoat than was worn in the mid-Victorian era, by the way, as the ruffles are only in the back of the petticoat to smooth the lines of the lobster tail bustle and to add extra volume in the back of the skirt. And the only reason that I can get away with just the one petticoat and bustle combo with this outfit is because it's made of very lightweight, unlined black silk taffeta. I made this gown back in 2016, before I had my historically accurate corset, and unfortunately it's one of a couple of costumes made for that old corset that don't fit over my new corset because of how short-waisted my old corset was. I also nicknamed this dress my garbage bag dress, as it's nearly impossible to get black silk to have it at a photograph well, and most of the time it winds up looking like a garbage bag. This dress is trimmed with lots of pleats and fringe, and the long train can be bustled up so that it doesn't drag on the floor. Next up is my green wool winter bustle gown, based on this fashion plate from 1876. Because of the weight of this dress, I wear not only the lobster tail bustle, but also a large bum pad on top, and I wear it with my quilted petticoat instead of the ruffled petticoat, because the organy ruffles would not stand up to the weight of the wool, or especially the weight of the overskirt, which is wool lined with taffeta and trimmed with faux fur. The quilted petticoat not only provides warmth for winter, but it also really helps to keep the skirts nice and full. I made a video back in February about how I made this dress, so I'll link that video down below if you would like to learn more about it. My last mid-1870s dress is not based on any plate or anything in particular, and it's also not normal fashion. It's my 1870s skating dress. This is made of wool and trimmed with real fur that was from a torn up old vintage coat I found at a junk sale for a dollar. Because I made this at about the same time as the green wool bustle dress, and both were made for an out-of-state trip, I actually made the quilted petticoat with a whole bunch of buttons and buttonholes on it, so that I could flip up the bottom foot or so of the petticoat, button it in place, and wear it at the shorter length needed for the skating dress. I also wear the lobster tail bustle under this, since that's short enough that it's still covered by the skirts. This is a very fun outfit to wear, and I've actually ice skated in it, and I also wore it to go hiking in the snow last year. Another mid-1870s costume I made is actually one of my most recent makes, my Daniel Deronda writing habit. Since you have just recently watched a handful of videos on the making of this project, and also because as a writing habit it doesn't really fit the standard style evolution of regular Victorian fashions, I won't go into any more detail here. But if you missed any of the making of videos, I will link a playlist for those down below. This next fashion plate, according to the one source that I found online, is supposedly from 1877. I say supposedly because there's no actual date on the plate, and to me it looks like it couldn't be from any later than 1875 or 1876 because it still has quite a pronounced bustle. And by 77, we were pretty firmly in the natural form period. This plate jumped out at me because of how many other eras it was trying to pull from, which I thought was kind of fun, and I believe this was the third bustle dress that I ever made. The front pulled from the zone front dresses of the 1780s, and I feel like the sleeves were trying to go for some sort of Renaissance-inspired moment. This dress is nearly entirely made from things from Joanne's, green quilting cotton, ivory cotton sateen, and even the fringe, though the purple satin ribbon did come from a different local shop. This one, because of all the ruche trim on the skirt, is very heavy, and so I wear this with the bum pad on top of the lobster tail bustle again, though I pair it with a ruffled petticoat instead of the quilted one, since this skirt does not need any help maintaining its own volume. I also made an evening bodice for this, made of cotton sateen and trimmed with the green cotton, which I pleated up neatly and beaded with pearls. I made it lace up the front, since while the majority of ball gown bodices in this era closed up the back, some did lace or button up the front instead, and I wanted to be able to put it on easily. This next ensemble was the first bustle dress I ever made, which was back in 2013, and it doesn't really fall into any specific style year, because I didn't really know as much then, and also because it was my own invention, and not based on any fashion plate research. 
I call it my Ravenclaw bustle, and originally I made it for both Halloween and for SteamCon, complete with a Ravenclaw patch and a wand pocket, though those have since been removed. If I had to try to place a year on it, I would say that it's late 1870s, like as we're starting to go into the natural form era. It's made of plaid cotton homespun fabric with a bodice of navy wool, and it's trimmed with navy wool pleats and some fluffy gold to black furry trim. I made a detachable tail to go on it to look a bit like a bird's tail, which is made with the navy wool with some gold velvet throw pillowcases carefully pieced together to show as the inside of those waterfall pleats. This tail is actually super heavy and not historically accurate like at all, so most of the times I've worn this dress I've worn it without the tail. I wear this with the lobster tail bustle and the ruffled petticoat underneath. Now let's take a look at the natural form era. Of course, if you've been following along with my Tuesday sewing vlogs, you will know all about the one that I'm currently working on, which most likely dates to 1877. If you've missed any of these videos, I will leave a link to the playlist of them down in the description, and there will be another video on the bodice progress coming out on Tuesday. I do, though, have one other natural form gown, which was inspired by this fashion plate from 1879. This one was made in 2019 for the Costume College Gala and is made of pink and green striped silk satin and raspberry silk taffeta, both from the LA Fabric District, and was trimmed with a variety of laces, including one that needed to be so wide that I actually needed to seam two other laces together to achieve the appropriate width. Figuring out all of the pleated and ruched sections of the raspberry silk was also quite complicated, but I was very happy with the outcome. For a long time, I had been afraid of wearing natural form era dresses as a plus size person, thinking that they would look unflattering on me. But making this dress luckily proved me wrong, as I did find it to be quite flattering. Since that's it for me for natural form dresses, let's move on to the 1880s. I don't have nearly as many 1880s ensembles as I do 1870s, and when I do wear 1880s outfits, I tend to wear them with 1870s hair because I just find 80s hair so unflattering. So that's mostly what you'll see in these pictures. I've noticed that I really have a thing for patterns and stripes in my 1880s dresses, so I do feel like these all wind up looking just a little bit similar. In 2019, I made a plaid walking dress that was supposed to be a copy of this fashion plate from 1883, but wound up being a bit different. For one, at the time, I was still afraid of the natural form era, so I made mine a bit later 1880s. I also had to forgo some of the skirt detail because the fabric was from the Costume College bargain basement, and I just didn't have that much of it. And lastly, I screwed up. I didn't realize until after the skirt was done and the bodice was pretty far in progress that I cut the asymmetrical bodice backwards and the buttons wound up going to the wrong side. Oh well, I still think it looks cute. This is worn over the lobster tail bustle and ruffled petticoat since the questionable content fabric holds its own body quite well and is kind of mid-weight and also because the skirt was cut a bit narrower due to the lack of fabric. Another dress that has somewhat similar lines is my pink silk walking dress. My best guess is that this plate dates to about 1884, since the bustle is quite pronounced. I was working with a limited amount of fabric for this dress as well, so I wasn't able to go with quite as large a bustle as I would have liked, and my underskirt turned out quite a bit different, since double faced silk satin was the wrong fabric to choose to be able to get the skirt drape and details of the fashion plate. I also wear this over just the lobster tail and ruffled petticoat since the fabric is unlined so the ensemble is quite lightweight. My peppermint seaside bustle that I made last year was primarily based on this fashion plate from 1884 and is made of Christmas quilting cotton from Joann's. For this one I went full huge 1880s bustle so it is worn with the lobster tail bustle, bustle pad, and quilted petticoat, though the heavy petticoat was mostly because I finished it in the winter. As I already have a series of vlogs on this channel about this dress, I won't go into any more detail, but I will leave a link to the playlist down below in the description. The peppermint bustle was a nice replacement to my other older seaside bustle, which I believe was the second bustle dress that I ever made, I think back in 2014. This one, unfortunately, A, fits my old corset, and B, has a giant stain on the overskirt that I didn't notice for a couple of years and sadly refuses to come off. 
It is based on this fashion plate, which I believe is from about 1886 or so, based on the very high neckline and long lines of the bodice that are paired with quite large bustles. Bodices started to take on a very elongated look in about 1885 to 86, and bustles started to diminish in 1888, so this one I think fits in somewhere between those years. I wore this one over my lobster tail and ruffled petticoat, and it's a lightweight cotton ensemble. The only ensemble I've made from the late 1880s is actually my fancy dress daisy costume, which was based on this fashion plate from 1888. I have a couple videos on my channel about how I made this costume, so I'll link them down below, but it was very fun to make such a light and summery costume, even if I did make it at the totally wrong time of year. Since this is a fancy dress, it doesn't really follow the regular fashions of the time, but I wear this over my lobster tail bustle, a shortened petticoat, and then it has its own plain cotton underskirt since the overskirt's pretty sheer. After 1888, the bustles go away again, to be replaced by just a bum pad. And since sleeves have not gotten large and exciting, like in the mid-1890s, that means that the next several years of fashion are kind of boring to me, so I have nothing from those years. So, skipping ahead to the mid-1890s, I do have a few ensembles from then. All of these basically fall into the years 1894 to 1895, when sleeves were at their apex, because I really enjoy a giant sleeve. All of my 1890s dresses are worn over a sort of a tiered petticoat and a small bum pad. So, in no particular order, let's start with my 1890s blue wool tea gown, modeled after an extant tea gown in my antique collection. I made this last year on my channel, so I will link those videos down below, but I wound up patterning this myself, and it's made of light blue, lightweight wool, trimmed with velvet ribbon. It had held the record for the most covered buttons I'd ever made for any one project at 32, until this last week when I needed 35 for my current natural form gown project. My oldest 1890s ensemble is this plaid walking outfit that I made in 2015 out of some heavy, almost denim-like plaid that I picked up from the Costume College Bargain basement. There was barely enough of it for the skirt and bodice, so I supplemented with a cotton fabric that had an embroidered stripe on it from Joann's for the sleeve poofs and the neckline area. The sleeves have an interior fitted sleeve as well, and then between that and the outer poof layer, it's stuffed with net so that they maintain their poof. But in hindsight, I think flat lining with a couple layers of the net would have worked a lot better. Next up is the mid-1890s yellow silk evening gown that I made for the gala at Costume College 2018, whose theme was royalty. I took inspiration from a whole bunch of royals from the era and combined them all into this one gown. The skirt has a built-in structure, like a lot of 1890s skirts, which is based on being flatlined with a fabric with more body and then having a very deep facing of horsehair canvas, which winds up making the skirt quite heavy and stiff. The bodice is trimmed with ruched beaded mesh, and the sleeves are made of several layers of sheer fabrics, such as organdy, organza, the beaded mesh, and more. I hand sewed a whole bunch of beaded appliques and trims onto the skirt, since I wasn't about to go hand embroidering or hand beading my skirt, which was so popular in that era for couture gowns. I also made all of my jewelry, and I re-wore the royal sash I had made for the 1860s turquoise gala gown. My last mid-1890s outfit is the Swiss Dot Ensemble I made last summer, based on Waiting by the Fountain, which was painted by Vittorio Matero Corcos in 1896. I will link to the making of videos for this down in the description, but it's a very lightweight cotton ensemble trimmed with purple silk rayon velvet. By 1896, the sleeves are just starting to diminish a tiny bit from their apex of 94 to 95, as you can see here. Moving into the late 1890s, my next ensemble is actually a bathing suit. This was made of navy wool and a light blue fabric that was sold to me as wool, but I think may actually be a wool silk blend. It consists of a tunic and then bloomer type pants and a sash, and I've actually worn it in the water, both for swimming in a pool and for wading into the ocean, and it did quite well in both situations. My last Victorian ensemble is a skirt and shirtwaist combo dating to the late 1890s. Separates had become exceedingly popular, particularly for working class women. 
This outfit consists of a wool skirt, which again has the built-in structure like my gala gown skirt, as well as a three-quarter sleeve shirtwaist made of lightweight cotton plaid with white collar and cuffs. I believe both the plaid and the wool fabrics came from the Costume College bargain basement. Because it turns out that this was pretty much the exact same color plaid as my other 1890s plaid ensemble, <laughs> I even wear this with the same hat that I decorated for that outfit, which is really handy, and I pair this blouse with a vintage navy clip-on tie to complete the look. And since Queen Victoria died in 1901 and my next ensemble in my costume collection dates to 1903, that is the end of my Victorian wardrobe. I know, it was a lot. <laughs> Counting all of my Victorian outfits up, it turns out that I have 30 full outfits plus a few extra evening bodices and that doesn't even include my historical cosplays of late 1830s Cinderella, 1880s Jane from Tarzan, or 1890s Elsa. Obviously though, all of these outfits consist of a whole bunch of different style eras, but Baby costumer me wanted to someday have one costume of every style era, and it's nice to know that not only do I have that, but for the 1870s and 80s, and maybe even for the 1890s, I could probably spend at least a few days at an era-specific event and not have to make anything new for it. Speaking of the 1870s and 80s, I am working on a video that ties in both to this video and also to a lesser degree, my video on the costumes of the Gilded Age, which will cover the evolution of fashions specifically in the bustle era, along with the bustle support itself. And it'll go from about 1869 to 1889 as it evolves out of the elliptical cage crinoline and then disappears into the small bum pad. I'll be looking at how the styles changed year by year based on fashion plates. So if that sounds like something you're interested in, please make sure that you're subscribed and that you've hit the little bell icon so that you're notified when that video comes out. Also, if you liked this video, please make sure to click the thumbs up icon as it really does help me out. I post videos here on YouTube twice a week with my sewing vlogs out on Tuesdays and other random costuming content like this out on Saturdays, but I post every day over on my Instagram, so please go follow me on Instagram, that's at Lady Rebecca Fashions. And if you'd like to help support all of the work that I do on this channel, I do have a link to my Patreon and my Ko-fi down in the description below. I'd also like to give a special shout out to my Edwardian level patrons, Sharon, Julie, and Mirage. Thank you all so, so much for joining me today. I hope you all have a wonderful week, and I will see you very soon in my next video. Happy sewing!